Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Senator Tom Cotton represents Arkansas. He was also in Harvard Law School when 9-11 happened. Good morning, Senator. How are you? I'm doing well, Hugh. Good morning to you. Uh, can you tell us your reaction? I haven't talked much about the 9-11 anniversary today because I was waiting for you. Can you tell or remind the audience of your reaction to 9-11, what you did thereafter? Well, yeah, Hugh, like uh, most Americans alive that day. I mean, I remember it very vividly back in the day when dinosaurs roamed the earth before smartphones and Wi-Fi. Uh, everybody in my class didn't know what had happened for about an hour, hour and a half until we walked out and saw the anxiety, the tears, the concern of so many classmates who had been from or worked in the New York metro area. Um, but, uh, you know, from that day forward, I had really resolved to join our country's military and fight for freedom overseas. It took me a few years to finish school and get all my financial and professional affairs in order uh, to do that, but uh, I ended up serving about five years in active duty in Iraq and Afghanistan, and uh, you know, I think as we look back on uh, that terrible morning, uh, it's a reminder that there are monsters out there in the world, uh, and they mean to do the United States harm, and that we didn't take them seriously in the 1990s, and that we should be taking them seriously now, not just the threats of terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda and ISIS, but Chinese communists or Iranian theocrats and others. Now, Senator Cotton, on 9-12, America came together and marched forward unified for a while. I was reading yesterday Winston Churchill's first volume of the World War I memoir. And, he, you know, England was on the verge of a civil war in Ireland in the spring and early summer of 1914. And Churchill writes in his memoir, he's first Lord of the Admiralty, the world did not realize that if anything were to happen that threatened Great Britain, it would instantly turn to and come into line, and as it did. Do you think the same thing would happen in America today? Well, Hugh, my main priority would be ensuring that we never have to test that hypothesis, uh, that we never have another day like we did on 9-11, or for that matter, December 7th, 1941, that we are so strong and so resolute uh, that no terrorist organizations can succeed in attacking us, nor a country like China or Iran or Russia can uh, get the drop on us and launch that kind of surprise attack against us. Um, but, but failing that, I'm confident the American people, uh, obviously, as we did after 9-11, as we did after Pearl Harbor, uh, would be unified uh, in determination to fight back and punish our aggressors and defeat them. I, I agree with that. I, I agree with that completely. Now to the tough question. Do you believe the President Biden's trip abroad made the world safer or more dangerous, and why? Unfortunately, Hugh, it made America, uh, or put America at greater risk, as it normally does, because it, it illustrated that he's just not up for the job, the bumbling and the stumbling in India and Vietnam, um, you know, the kind of excessive rhetorical deference to communist China, insisting that we don't mean to contain them, that we simply want to have a, a positive, friendly relationship. These are the kinds of things that uh, aggressive dictators like Xi Jinping or Vladimir Putin see as weakness and, and inviting and tempting uh, our adversaries to take a shot at the title. The exact kind of weakness, for instance, that John F. Kennedy projected in 1961 and 1962 through a long train of concessions that led uh, Nikita Khrushchev and the Politburo to believe they couldn't put nuclear missiles in Cuba. Um, so it, it's a regrettable fact that Joe Biden doesn't just project weakness as a matter of deliberate policy and the choices his administration makes, like, for instance, paying $6 billion in ransom for hostages in Iran, but also in his manner and his affect in the simple way that he appears in public. Now, Senator, the Ukrainian policy of the president has left America divided and confused. I don't actually think it's his policy. I think it's Jake Sullivan's policy, but the national security advisor. But it's confusing. And David Petraeus, who rarely steps out, stepped out last week in Great Britain and said, America has to sell, I think they're called ATACs, I'm not sure, long-range missiles, like our allies have done, but not in sufficient quantities, or give them to Ukraine. Do you agree, and do you see any threat of coherence in the administration's policy on Ukraine? Uh, no, Hugh. Uh, I support Ukraine. I don't support Ju Joe Biden's Ukraine policy. For 18 months, he's pussyfooted around, indulged half measures, uh, which, as usual, have not succeeded. Um, actually, I could go back more than 18 months, Hugh, as we were talking. 
earlier about deterring threats, Joe Biden tempted Vladimir Putin to a trial of strength to borrow from Churchill's sinews of peace speech in 2021 to do what he's always wanted to do. Vladimir Putin has always wanted to reassemble the old constituent parts of the uh, Russian Empire, Ukraine foremost among them. Um, it happened under Barack Obama, then it happened under Joe Biden. I tell my Democratic friends in the Senate that uh, I notice that Vladimir Putin only invades Ukraine when re Democrats are president. Yeah. And there's a reason for that, because they project weakness and hesitancy and timidity in the face of Russian aggression. That wasn't the case with Donald Trump. I mean, you know, the former President Trump on your show last week, I heard, said that this would have never happened if he were president. He, he should actually take a little more credit for it. It did not happen. He's not in the situation of most presidential candidates of saying what would or would not happen. It did not happen for four years because we took a strong and resolute stand. But with Joe Biden, you had him immediately extending the New START Treaty with no concessions from Russia, Vladimir Putin's number one priority. You had him then uh, waiving sanctions on Nord Stream 2 that President Trump had imposed, Vladimir Putin's second priority. You had him rewarding Vladimir Putin with a glitzy summit in Europe in the summer of 2021. You had the uh, debacle in Afghanistan just a few weeks after which uh, Russia began to marshal troops on Ukraine's borders. So Joe Biden tempted Vladimir Putin to go for the jugular, and then that having failed to deter it, he continued to just trickle out the flow of arms to Ukraine, only enough so they wouldn't lose, but certainly not enough so they could win decisively. And the long-range missiles that you mentioned, they're called ATACMs, Army Tactical Missile Systems, should have been provided months ago, should have been provided last year, just like every other missile or weapon system to you. We've seen this repeatedly. Joe Biden draws some silly red line because he's afraid of Vladimir Putin's uh, policy of bluff. And then three or six months later, he relents and he sends the weapons when it's too late to have stopped the Russian invasion or stopped the invasion in the tracks, or it's harder to try to reverse that invasion, as you see now, because Russia has dug in deep on defensive lines. So uh, I, I agree with the Dave Petraeus recently said, I've been saying it myself for more than a year, and, and as you sometimes allude to, what Richard Nixon said in the Yom Kippur War should have been our policy from the very beginning of Ukraine, send everything that shoots on everything that flies. Well said. Now, Senator, I want to go back to politics, uh, and I don't know if you heard David Axelrod yesterday. I, I want to play for you. It's a long clip, but I want to play for you cut number 27 so I can get your reaction. David Axelrod is very smart. Very, very smart. His memoir, Believers, 40 Years in Politics, is maybe the best book by a leftist I've read. And he's a very nice guy. Here is Axelrod. Well, look, uh, I've been very clear from the beginning. Uh, let, let me say one thing as a preface to this. Uh, Phil said an, uh, something important, which is, you know, hooking up, connecting up with the nation's mood. You can't jawbone people into feeling better. You can't jawbone people into thinking that whatever they're experiencing isn't what they're experiencing. And, you know, I think that uh, the, the president has to find a way to talk about the things that he's done in a context other than kind of asking for a report card from the American people, because if that's what he does, uh, it's pretty clear right now that that's not going to work out well. If he takes more populist bent on the fights that he's fought and why he's fought them, I think he has a better chance. But in terms of your question, Poppy, I've been very clear from the beginning. If you gave me Joe Biden and lopped 15 years off of him and gave me this record, uh, I would be very confident about the next election polls notwithstanding. That is not the case. And I don't, you know, navigating this age issue is hard because people are not just saying, how is he performing now? They're also trying to uh, postulate how he'll perform uh, when he's 83, 84, 85. And uh, that's a difficult question to answer. But he is running. I mean, he's made clear that he is running. And I can tell you that the mood of Democrats is that as long as he is running, uh, no one wants to challenge him and weaken him in what many Democrats consider an existential fight with Donald Trump. You know, now if Trump went away, I think the feeling might be different. I don't know. But no president has ever been uh, benefited from a primary challenge, and, and presidents generally w win primary challenges. So, you know, I think this is in Joe Biden's hands, and he has to decide uh, whether he can uh, whether he can complete this task and win this election and prevent uh, what many people fear would be a disaster for the country. And if not, then he should step aside. But, uh, no, you know, what I think and what other people think is not 
uh, terribly All right, important. That what he was the punchline, Senator Cotton. Then he should step <laughs> aside. What did you think of that? Well, I, I can translate that into shorter and more direct English uh, from our friend David Axelrod is that Joe Biden is too old to be president. And he shouldn't run yep. for re-election if the Democrats want to win. Yep. Uh, Had you heard that? Hugh, Hugh I, I got to say, too, I mean, that he's right that people are not just thinking about today, but they're thinking about four or five years from now. I mean, you can go back and look at tape of Joe Biden just from the 2020 campaign, much less from, say, 2016 when he was out on the stump for Hillary Clinton. And you can see how much he's declined just in two and a half years in office. I mean, it is a simple fact of aging, Hugh, that some people get old very fast. They, they may seem with it and together today, and within six months, they seem 10 months older. So we don't even know what Joe Biden is going to be capable of a year from now. That's another reason why I think he's polling so poorly. It's not just his terrible record, but what people project in the future. And maybe the worst case scenario, they know that a vote for Joe Biden is also a vote for Kamala Harris. This sets off the progressive left, Senator. As you know, it makes them very angry. But I am concerned about national security, so I don't worry about them being very angry. I pray for the president every day because I always do. But I do not think the country is safe if an old man who is you, visibly uh, impaired is, is running the country. You let, let me put it this way. Um, you know, we know from archives and interviews and historical research that Adolf Hitler did not think that the West would actually – keep its promises to Poland in September of 1939. And in fact, he said of Chamberlain and the other Western leaders, I saw them at Munich, they're little worms. Well, maybe, maybe Adolf Hitler would have calculated differently if he thought his invasion of Poland would have led to the sequence of events that brought Churchill to power in Great Britain. Uh, so it is a simple fact that aggressive adversaries like Xi Jinping don't just look at the United States in the abstract, they look at the specific character and abilities of the President of the United States. And they're looking at what does President Harris mean. Uh, Senator, always great to talk to you. You didn't bring up the Browns' big victory over the Bengals. I hope you watched that yesterday. Smashing victory. Congratulations. Browns Nation. Yeah, that's the first time I've ever heard Senator Cotton, congratulate Browns Nation. We're going to keep that in frame. And thank you, Senator. I'll be right back with Kyle Mills, author of this brand new thriller, Code Red, the latest Vince Flynn book. Stay tuned. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are